Thanks, Don. It's a pleasure to be here and having had the opportunity to spend a few days here, get a feel for the place. Can I extend my feel for the place by asking how many of you are designers? How many of you are engineers? How many of you are social scientists? My hands up how many of you never raised their hands? <laughs> what are you? You can do anything you want. Here's another one. Uh, I'm a medical doctor and a neuroscientist. Good. Thanks. That gives me a little bit of a feeling. Uh, Don said he is each and every, and I am struggling same likewise with my identity, but not in a negative way. And in preparing this talk, I posted a title about design widening from products and services, and I wanted to share um, my experiences in the design field. It's actually longer than the period I put here. And in preparing for this talk, I thought let's grab bits from what I may have to offer that's hopefully interesting for you. And I put some stuff up, and of course I have too many slides, um, but some of them are just for moving through to get, get a feel uh, for stuff. So let me start with one of the things um, I've been working in design for a long time, and can you read this? You don't have to read it, but you will recognize it if you look at the Interactions uh, edition of last November, December, it's there. One of the problems is the word design means very many things to many different people. For example, if you read the Design Expo, it's typically what people talk, the design. We show you the design that is the thing that was designed, so the object that's the result. There's People, when they talk about design, they focus about the act of doing design. And that's actually what I will be using the term for. So I prefer to talk about designing rather than uh, the noun. <coughs> um, the people saying design should lead innovation. So that, that's design, that's the cast of designers. Or the design changes the world. That is a new way of, well maybe not new way, but a specific way of dealing with problems and solutions and having many people engaged. Um, it is done by design, by purpose, not by accident. And then there's of course the styling aspect of designer genes and designer this and that. I will be focusing on design as maybe a problem solving or an opportunity matching uh, exercise and coming towards a preferred state in the world as Herbert Simon uh, said it. I'm from Delft, the University of Delft, that is in Europe, this country, the Netherlands, several, I think 12 universities, three technical ones, and I'm from the one which can be characterized by this wonderful um, geographic indication that we are 25, 52 degrees north, 4 degrees east, and 19 centimeters below sea level. <laughs> you can imagine that we have quite a famous department of uh, civil engineering, and half the team who run this are designers. Always the project management is done by design students. If you type on Google ambulance drone, that was a hit last year, a graduation student wanted, out of his will, he wanted to do something positive with drones, because he was a drone enthusiast in one place, and he designed a portable AED which, if you analyze the network constraints, could bring an AED to a location where you called with your mobile phone within one minute. It and is an AED. Oh, sorry, that's a defibrillator, portable defibrillator. It's a thing which hangs on the wall in every public building saying AED. I don't know what its spells are. Some of you certainly will. Um, the School of Design is, I'd say, huge. For School of Design, we have 2,000 uh, bachelor and master students. Every year, an intake of 300 in the bachelor and also 300 in the masters. By now, we've had 5,000 alumni because we've been around for a long while. And we have quite a large research uh, program. Half of this is on user experience factors. I'm one of 25 full professors and I'm also director of the graduate school and overseeing the activities of 140 PhD candidates, all in design. 
We have an education program with a broad bachelor, three uh, master programs of 100 students each, and then the individual PhD uh, project. And we are proud of our alumni. Of, in design circles, most of Adria van Hooydonk, who's achieved designer at BMW, so we really mean something. Uh, this is a quirky project, which you may have seen. It is the Sense Umbrella, the only umbrella that is tested in wind tunnels and can stand up to 100 kilometers per hour. Gale winds. It's the only umbrella I've ever found that works in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Van Move bicycles are really interesting. They're not expensive. They don't do their own advertising. They leave their users to post the pictures. Uh, and they integrated the lights, the things which break most, uh, most often, and actually the, the new lock bike chain all into the frame. A, a lot of integration going on there. Um, especially focusing also on making things people friendly. This is Oh, what do you call it? An incubator. But that's in English where you have pre-born babies. Incubator. Incubators, good. And this is, has been designed also with the eye of what this does emotionally with the parents, to have your child in, better in this than in an aquarium. Um, recently, with 3D printing, this is a spin-off which uh, makes fit to the body um, exoskeletons to protect against an injury. That's the type of project. I want to say something about myself, and this is me some time ago. This is my younger brother. This is a little while ago, but this should introduce me. And if I look my course I did, I did physics, which was because that was what I was good at in high school and just continued that. I actually grew bored with physics and there was an opportunity in the design school. I thought, hey, that might be a challenge. I joined the group doing perception uh, research. We bought the first commercial virtual reality simulator, a nice little helmet of three kilograms, much like an Oculus Rift, but 20 years earlier and uh, slightly more clunky. Um, I stayed on doing stuff with visualization, developing techniques, and also because we are a very big school, doing the education for designers is also a part for my research, has always been a driver for my research and also always been a part, so storyboarding techniques. Um, I started out after, um, after my PhD to develop tools for designers and as in many places it was toys for the boys, playing with computers, things which are nice, which make sense and then also, when we were continuing the VR, we noticed it's three years of programming and you have a cube floating in space, which was interesting for the computer science guys, but not for designers. And we actually took two steps back. By then, the video projectors became affordable and actually having a nice sharp range, not requiring an hour of calibration as it was before. And we started playing with projecting on curved surfaces, projecting on tables and trying to make a CAD system that approaches the sketchiness. And in that we did things like projecting uh, textures and videos on the top of foam models to make rapid explorations possible. So that's the creative sketchy design tools section. When doing this, and notice that designers didn't like the cube floating in space, we also said, hey, if we're going to make these tools better, we actually should know more uh, about what designers are about. And actually, most of the people doing research at my time had their research training in another school. As of 2000, we got designers doing PhD research. And this is actually Janus Keller, designer, one of my first PhD uh, students. And we started to go into design offices and see how it's going. And one of the things of the design office was that it has many visual, uh, a visual culture, stuff on the wall, um, um, prototypes, models, samples all around you. And the worry at that time that all this was shoved into the little screen of a computer. And actually that took away, among other things, a lot of the social interactions at design offices. And as you see these days, if you have a photograph of people standing on a railway station, 
85% of the people is not there. And it's very few people interacting. We, we wanted to regain this in the computer context. Now, having gone to study how designers do their job, we, at the same time, the user experience wave was coming on. We started a new master program designed for interaction, user interaction, user focus. And I got into contact with Liz Saunders and aspects of design research, user studies became a large part of the research. And actually, in the past 10 years, I think most of the projects I've been doing is getting end users into design projects and making use of their expertise. And that's in opposite to coming to an end user saying, this is my product. Do you like it? Do you want this? But rather a process of involving people and giving them expressive means. And I'll be coming back to all of these elements. But I think one of the things also, as of course I've been in the field for a longer time and also grew from teaching only in elective courses, then running a master program for 100 students a year, and now being director of the graduate school, reflecting on methods, reflecting on the relation between design and research um, has become a bigger part of at least the things I write about. Now, Don's hiding over there. This is where I really got to meet Don. That was in 2006. Uh, our university awarded him an honorary doctorate, and here you see the handing out ceremony, which is with all full Dutch pomp and circumstance, and actually two little white wings. That was only secondary, of course, to his wonderful Padua thing. If, every, if you have seen it, you should ask for his regalia. Our students were much impressed, with, uh, impressed when they saw a photo of it and actually parodied it. And <laughs> so now you know what to watch for. Um, so, as I said, my first, my PhD was virtual reality, clunky machines, and we actually wanted to do experiments with people walking. So we put the entire, I don't know, 100, no, 300 kilogram simulator on a rails and walked behind someone who was walking. So that was very technology driven. I played around with throwing balls in virtual reality and simulating not the parabolic trajectories, but earlier medieval um, methods, and these produced wonderful cartoon effects, was great fun, but didn't really help designers. In the meantime, I joined a group that had been working on how to put sketchiness into computer interfaces, and I got to lead that group also, and we were uh, working on left-handed interfaces. What do you do? Let the left hand do. You don't give them the same thing to do uh, in that time. And got to studying how is sketching done? And this is just, just uh, an idea of the interesting thing. These are two pictures, uh, are traces of sketching actions by designers when sketching on a, uh, on a digital tablet. This is when the pen hits the paper. This is when the pen does not hit the paper. This is what typically everybody works with. This is also there. And I've always been intrigued in this negative space of the things we throw away because there may be actually a lot in them. And of course, this was the comparing the rich situation of a design environment with the computer-based situation, the situation that happened in, in many design offices. And you see the only inspiring remnant is the cup of coffee. <laughs> Interactive, I will not dwell on this. Um, now, reflecting on the type of research, now I want to talk about a research project, research through design, and how it's positioned uh, in our school. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Horvath, he reviewed 100 PhD theses up to 2005, I think. And he said, the type of research we do at the School of Design is different. I mean, we're a technical university, so this is not the type of research you do in art schools. It's much more technologically oriented. Um, but we do not do basic research as they do in regular universities. We do not develop new materials. Uh, we do not study the basic principles of psychology, but we use all those types of things. 
and actually at the university we do not do design practice. And he would actually say in design practice, no real research is done. The no activities purely for the generation of knowledge. What he said, in our school, he noted there are three different types. There's a community doing, using the methods of basic research and applying them in the, on design topics. So psychologists would, instead of doing research on color patches, do research on how colors are reflected on cars. Or this is multi-sensory research. Typically, this works in an, in an uh, experimental theory-driven paradigm where experiments are tested. On the other side, we have people doing a PhD on reflecting on how they do their design practice. In the case of colors, you would have people adding color pigments to food, combining their experience from 20 projects in industry and trying to derive patterns that operate there. This is typically done by people working in industry and pursuing a PhD over quite a long period. And in between, we have the area which my colleague calls design inclusive research because um, design is a part of doing the research and what the rest of the world calls research through design. Um, and it's an interesting clashing area. We see both sides of approaches coming. People who are theory driven build prototypes in order to <coughs> test a hypothesis they couldn't otherwise test. Um, people who are explorative driven create prototypes in order to open up a not yet existing phenomenon for study, for observation. And I've been working mostly on this uh, area. So dropping the high-end VR and moving to projected light, we're happy to get a grant from SARA and that's the computer uh, center in Amsterdam and we started to develop this sketchy way of doing VR projecting uh, surroundings on a back sheet, projecting on the table. Um, and this was my first uh, supervision of a PhD candidate who had a design background. And he had a, quite a different way of dealing things. A lot of making was happening and a lot of eclectic choosing what to take along. And when we mapped out, and this is what we see often that you run into many different scientific communities that you have to integrate. And then we were actually thinking, oh, the designer will integrate it all. And when you're doing a solo PhD project, you might have to, to an agree. In larger research projects, it's usually different uh, people working on that. But mapping out which different scientific communities um, uh, are part of the problem that you're studying um, is an important thing. And sometimes you find things which you didn't learn before. So one of the things we found with uh, studying how designers operate and how, uh, how virtual reality systems actually were at the time is that you have these three scales of interaction. One of the things is that the environment is typically for your orientation, inspiration also. You use detailed actions only in a very small part on the table and the large table is especially for laying out, for organizing your thoughts. At the time, I had colleagues who pursued in virtual reality. Some of them had caves, others had uh, touch tables, and others were working on detail stuff, and each of them thought their tool was the fit all. But the problem was we wanted to publish this, and then you have to find the community. And when you find the community, you will find that in order to publish there, you need to know all their literature. And if you want to do one PhD, one of the lessons I find is in a design project, you learn a lot of things about many different areas, which could be a contribution. But you can't write an article in itself. You have to find other ways to share it or to keep it. Um, so there was a lot of play part of this. And one of the things which worked very well is to project surface uh, textures on top of foam models. It allowed um, people to make shape and form explorations, I'd say 10, 20, 30 times faster, because the normal way to do it is create a SOLIDWORKS model, 
map it in a specialized software, and that's a half and a half. It's an afternoon of work, at least, to get those textures on here. This is a quarter of a second. You can reject so many opportunities within a few minutes, and you can actually do this together. That's one of the things, bringing the interaction out of the machine into the social arena. Um, one of the interesting findings there is, for instance, if you project from the top, people will see the shadow and the rest of the projection. And of course, you can try to cut that out in the software, etc. And then you spend your life on calibration, and we didn't want to do that. So Daniel Sarkis thought up a little trick, camera over here, image on the projector, through a mirror on the table, projecting over the table. And at this side is the window, or at least something which will not show up the rest of the projected light. And that's very important, it turned out to be, for the convincingness of the, the visual appearance over here. Actually, you could have put the projector on the table and have projected it over there, but the magic of not seeing this appeared to be quite important when a group of people was exploring how an object looks in this array of structured light. So there's these little tricks, which I think are part of what you learn in the design. And some of them said, well, just think that away when you're doing it. And then you find out that people can't and you can't even do it yourself. Um, I tried to summarize this as, as a model in that, that Janus's project, there was a design goal, create uh, an interactive workstation for the inspirational imagery that designers use. It led us through several in iterations. At each of the iterations, what you do is you draw in knowledge from a variety of areas, and there is an opportunity, but also a challenge in, to feed that back into those areas. This got published in 2007 in a wonderful design-led, but now a different type of design. This was artistically designed book. They had a very good graphic designer, etc. They redid my sketchy picture to something which is much more strict. And I overlooked that these arrows are pointing outward, where they should be pointing inward. So here's one, one lesson I drew from that. If someone else does the graphics for your book, check it time and time and time again. If you believe diagrams are important, otherwise you'll suffer. Another thing that we, we found in that period is actually quite some confusion when people came, a lot of people came into the labs and got demos, etc. And they said, when can we buy this? And his, his station for organizing images was not designed to be bought. It was designed to give understanding, to give knowledge. And, but because he was a designer by training, people expected him to make products. And we took quite a while to, to see how to make this story. And this story has helped uh, quite a lot of people. So there's a designer when you're talking about things. There's a tool. That's what our group uh, is aiming at, making tools for designers. And for instance, if the product is a mixer for in the kitchen, you have a conception of who the user is. And then, of course, you're doing a PhD, so you're also a researcher. And also the researcher uses instruments, etc. And so the confusions that arose, people ask, when can we buy it? And you're making something so it's not research. The, 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 some people, a lot of people think design is one thing, research is another thing. And if it's one, it can't be the other. We had that in the 80s and 90s when our school was filled with practicing uh, designers and researchers brought from the outside. And people ask, are you a researcher? Oh, then you can't talk about design. Are you a designer? Oh, then you can't talk about research. I've seen that change in the, in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, so it's not mutually exclusive. And also we got to the question, if the designer, if you are the designing the tools for the designer, then he is a user of the tools. But a lot of people say, users cannot do design. It is only designers who can do that. So those were confusions. And we found our way out of it by looking at roles rather than professions. And if you look at the relation between the designer who uses the design tool, 
shown here as a pencil to create the product for a user that creates a triangular relation. Here's the product. This is designer of the product. This is the user of the product. And I urge people never to use the word designer or user without specifying what the product is. Because if you look one level up, here's the tool developer researcher. He's making the design tool, which is used by um, the professional designer. And actually, if you look further on, the user who is cooking a meal is actually quite create, can be quite creative in creating the meal as a product and has yet other people who will make use of that. So it can sometimes help not to say what is the role of the designer or who is the designer, but actually who takes on the role of the designer. Now this triangular relation also shows one of the things that are tearing designers doing a PhD apart. On the one hand, there's the push to create a solution that works in the world. On the other hand, there's the push to create knowledge that can be used by others. And one of the things that Janus did in his image station, um, he didn't put in an ethernet cable, which at that time was the way to get things through the internet. You had to come up with a stick. And a lot of people said, oh no, no, you can put in an ethernet cable. It's so much easier. Yes, but if I let them put in their images with a stick, I can actually observe when they're doing it. And they can't just swamp in hundreds of images. They have to do it with a ritual one at a time, opening it up for discussion and, and study. So the decisions that are made in making a research prototype are about what knowledge will it generate. The decisions made making a product is what use is it in the world. And sometimes these do not go together. Now this is my big picture of all these roles and it helped to clarify a few issues. So at none of the levels I used, I called someone a designer or a user because I need that for relations. And at each of the levels you have a culture. And I think at each of the levels you can see who is acting, um, what are the tools that they're using, where is it happening, um, what's the community, what is the discourse, what type of words are used, what type of notions are used, what is written, uh, what values are they used, how do they communicate, what comes out uh, in products and in knowledge. Same time you can also look and compare what's the same about each of the levels. Each of the levels people drink coffee to stay awake. Each of the levels we have limited um, cognitive abilities, etc. And we can use the triangle between each of the levels. And there's two common notions in uh, design. The, the fact of reflective practice, also part of education. If you train a student to become a designer, you don't want him to use methods as a recipe. You want to, him to raise, to rise above the level of doing it to the level of understanding it so he can change his methods and adapt his methods. Actually, then you, you rise one level up. And what participatory design is trying to do is to engage users into the level of being able to bring in their expertise of their daily lives in the considerations that lead design. So that's two things which help us fit. And then, of course, you can repeat that at the different levels. And as every system goes, it breaks down somewhere. But it does help to organize your thoughts. It also can help to organize your books. Design. How am I for time? Uh, you're roughly out, so you should be coming to a close. Then I come to a close, and I <laughs> only come to a close by stating four different types of design uh, that we've seen over the last time. Traditionally, and when I came in 1984, this was standard, there's a manufacturer who, can, who has certain machines. We have great metalwork skills and machines and a range of kitchen utensils out. Let's make a new one. Here's a garbage bin and the designer would get uh, the brief. Make a new one, should cost $10. We should be able to sell it for 25 and your target group is newlyweds. And it would go up to the attic and design and it would come out. 
uh, usually no interaction with users. On the other hand, Dawa Egberts uh, did a study in how, a deep study in how people liked coffee. They found out that people didn't want the big pots because a lot would be thrown away and, it's, and everyone wanted individual portions and a lot of people liked this terrible creamy thing, apparently. Um, and on the basis of that, they designed the Senseo, which is, I think, very much like the Nespresso or others, but this was actually five years earlier and it changed the entire ways shopping malls were set up. Yet queues of little pads for coffee, pads for co-branding, pads for chocolate, pads for tea, and varieties of machines going on. So that's, this is where user research actually leads the design process. Well, this I won't have to talk about much. It can be argued that Starbucks sells atmosphere, not particularly coffee. And then the design actions are, how do you create atmosphere? How do you get the rights for the music? What should the interior design be, rather than the coffee itself? Um, and the one which intrigues me most is um, complex systems Hospitals, patients are often given the wrong medicines. Let's improve that. And the knee-jerk reaction is, let's put an IT system. Let's put a barcode on every patient, on every medicine. And let's put a computer which hands out only those, those medicines that the patient needs. Because what was going wrong in the dispensing round it was known, nurses gave the wrong medicines to patients. This happens, apparently happened quite a lot. Now the interesting thing of this approach is that it probably will work and will probably make it work in 80 years. <laughs> IT projects take a little time. What I found most striking is that in the Mayo Clinic, they actually looked more at what nurses did and they found out that being a nurse has one problem. You look like a nurse. What happens to you when you look like a nurse? Anyone? Interruptions. Nurse, I need to go to the toilet. Nurse, can you bring me mother up? Nurse, so the interruptions. So what they designed, if you're a designer, watch out, don't be shocked. A road worker's jacket, ugly as hell, very cheap, and it says, don't disturb me, I'm on a dispensing round. This solved, I think, either 70 or 85% of the problem. I th that's a very interesting thing if you are doing the user research for the IT project. What are you going to do? So I think. That's the area where design is moving into these complex areas where we need to harness the technology, but at the same time, we need to have a very thorough understanding of what happens in those sites. Would that be a good moment to stop, though? Excellent. Clarifying questions need? I probably am very clear. <laughs>